It can happen to almost anyone. Owning a restaurant, having an affair, covering up your friend's shenanigans, you know, life. Goodfellas is really about ordinary people living extraordinary lives. Of course, by extraordinary, I mean big money and big crime. But how the lives of Henry and Jimmy and the rest of the crew unfolded can happen to anybody. There are no rocket scientists here. They started out from the ground level, working their way to the top, using their street smarts and charm and having grit, something we can all have or simply need to work on. This is one of maybe half a dozen reasons why Goodfellas is a classic. It's relatable. We see it on the level we're comfortable with. We're not craning our necks from the nose. Bleeding heights of power, like with Scarface or The Godfather. Those worlds are virtually untouchable, but Goodfellas is the movie version of the mob guy next door. Although the movie is quite accurate, it leaves out plenty. Just imagine Henry Hill in the military. Henry, who was portrayed by the late Ray Liotta, took a break from the mob and joined the army. If only it could be said that Hill served his country for the same reasons Michael Corleone did in The Godfather, but it can't. Henry was a grade-A self-serving thug who joined the military to steer clear of a government probe into the mob ties with labor unions. According to Fandom's military wiki, Henry enlisted in the army when he was 17 after spending a few years in Paul Vario's crew. Vario, who was played by Paul Sorvino as Polly Cicero, was a capo on the Lucchese crime family and boss to Henry and fellow associates Jimmy Burke and Tommy Desimone. When he joined the 82nd Airborne, he may have left the mob behind because the mobster in him never went away. In the three years he served, Hill kept in contact with the mob and continued his many rackets, including loan sharking and selling tax-exempt smokes. His gangster attitude continued his social life as well, brawling with a civilian and Marines at a bar, and even stealing the local sheriff's vehicle. Three years was enough for him to safely return, where he served as a different kind of soldier. That's when Henry's criminal career went full throttle. It is ironic that, for a fleeting moment, he served the very institution that would finally put an end to the way of life he had worked so hard to establish. One of the rackets he had hoped would help maintain his lifestyle was a point-shaving scheme in the Boston College basketball games. He didn't do very well, and in 1979, roughly 50 members of organized crime went down because of it. And would you believe that Jimmy Burke, played by a legendary actor Robert De Niro as Jimmy Conway, went down for this because, of all things, because of previous phone calls? Off the Ball had interviewed the federal prosecutor handling Henry's case, Ed McDonald, who appears in the movie as himself. And its writer, Alex McCarthy, in his article describes how, by an unbelievable stroke of luck, the FBI stumbled upon the point-shaving scheme that would finally convict Burke and send him to prison. The stroke of luck was courtesy of Karen Hill, played by stunner Lorraine Bracco, who had mentioned to the FBI that she had gone up to Boston with Henry on their first week together. But when asked why, she couldn't say. By this time, Henry had already been cooperating with the feds on the Lufthansa heist investigation. The agreement was that he had to come clean about his involvement in not just the heist, but in all his other criminal activities. So, when asked about the Boston trip, he answered quite simply, they were fixing college basketball games. With that, something just clicked, because all of the sudden, the feds were focused on finding out more about this scheme. The funny thing was that Henry didn't even think it was a crime. The movie established Jimmy as the brains of the group, and maybe he was exactly that for a good reason. Because this point-shaving scheme was Henry's idea, and look where it got him. Had it been Jimmy's, would he have been more cautious? Probably not. McDonald said that like Henry, Jimmy didn't think rigging the game was illegal either. Honest mistake, am I right? It can happen to anyone. Now, if serving in the military failed to extinguish Henry's propensity for crime, then what was he thinking when he agreed to witness protection? Did he really think he would just settle into a suburban life? This boulder grade package was exactly the kind of lifestyle he had joined the mob to avoid. I mean, the picture painted of Hill is clear as day. This wise guy thought he was hot shit, and in the mob, he was. So, did anyone really think he would just sink comfortably into the role 
of a nameless nobody with no incident? One account says Henry was expelled from the program by a Seattle federal court after being convicted of trafficking cocaine. Another says he repeatedly revealed his true identity to neighbors, effectively rendering protection useless, and had to be relocated several times. This led to the FBI just giving up on him and finally booting him out of the program. Once back in the open, Henry never got whacked by his former colleagues, eventually expiring in a rather unremarkable way. Henry died of natural causes, the way it ends for nearly everybody living in the suburbs. And I think it's safe to say, there was no military gun salute at the funeral of Henry Hill, mainly because it probably wasn't a thing anymore, but still. Luckily for Tommy Desimone, he didn't get snagged in Henry's lame scheme, because, well, he was dead already. That, of course, was due in part by him being an excruciating pain in the ass. I mean, if you were difficult to work with, your boss would simply fire you. But you get the picture, right? Yes, Tommy was a real hothead, as masterfully portrayed by a pit bull of an actor, Joe Pesci, as Tommy DeVito. It may be that Pesci was perfect for Scorsese, and this, despite the fact that Pesci was much older, but perfect precisely because the diminutive actor was larger than life. Pesci stood at a mere five foot four, while the real Tommy was a tall, six foot, four inch, burly man. But Joe Pesci is simply explosive as Tommy. Enough said. As for his character being a man about town, Desimone was in fact a married man. It can be assumed, though, that he must have tried to have extramarital relations, but was simply too violent and unpredictable for anyone's liking. That streak seemed to be rooted in a sense of being the runt of the litter, which works nicely, with Pesci being much shorter than his co-stars. His exploits are not only seen, but heard, all throughout the movie, as he brags about them over drinks with the crew. The movie highlights the psychopath in him when he guns down Spider. What the movie doesn't show are the many other murders Tommy committed. One was of a random stranger when he was only 17. The reason? He was literally just showing off to Henry. He killed Ronald Gerote, a protege of then Gambino capo John Gotti, whom Tommy murdered because of Gerote's sister, whom he had dated but had also beaten up. And so, together with the murder of Gotti's other friend, Gambino button man Billy Batts, Tommy Desimone, the bane of Caprogin Palvario's existence, had to be put down like the rabid dog that he was. Not all of the lives behind Goodfellas was a sordid tale. Take Henry and Karen's love story, for instance. Sure, those two didn't hit it off at all when they first met, but it was perfect for Scorsese's already edgy film. The fact that Karen really did tear Henry down in real life, in front of all of his friends, is just gold. But how did we get here? You could say it's because Karen demanded Tommy to drive her to where Henry was. Well, then you'd be wrong. In real life, the double date was with Paul Vario's son, Paul Vario Jr., and not with Joe Pesci's Tommy. You see, the mob is its own social club. But more than that, helping out the boss's son earns you brownie points. Like I've mentioned before, doing favors is a common currency in business, including the mob. So, for an Irish Italian who would never get made, being Paul Jr.'s wingman was totally worth doing. <laughs>